Coming out of college, I just thought, well, where's my job now? Someone's supposed to give me a job, right? Didn't work like that. And there was no magic six-figure salary at the end of the college degree rainbow. I felt like I was lied to. I was told, follow this path and your life's gonna be great. And it, it wasn't. I was stressed. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Minority Mindset Show. I'm super excited for today's episode because not only did today's guest grow up in an immigrant household with not a lot of financial education, but by 2013, he was dead broke and thousands of dollars in debt. Fast forward 10 years later, and he's a millionaire investor. And not just that, he's also the author of the book, Breaking Free from Broke. And not just that, he's also the host of shows like The George Camel Show and The Ramsey Show. I'm talking about none other than George Camel, who is now on a mission to help people be better with their money and their finances. George, thank you for coming on, man. It's such an honor to be here. Dude, I have a lot of questions for you. I've got a lot of questions for you, but this is your show, so well, you call the shots. Thank you. The first thing I want to ask you is, I guess it's a two-part question. How did you go from broke to millionaire in 10 years, and what can the average person do in, let's say, five to seven to 10 steps to go from broke to millionaire in 10 years? Because a million dollars is, I think, what most people would call like the epitome of financial freedom, if I could be worth a million dollars, how can somebody do that and how did you do that? Mm, that's a great question. I, I think it started with a paradigm shift. I don't think you can actually escape broke mm. until you change your mindset, yeah. your beliefs about money. Sure. And whether you learn the wrong things about money or you didn't learn anything about money, yeah. it takes some education, but you have to change your mind and go, this is not who I am. So I'm not going to be broke for life. What, what was your initial money kind of mindset before you started changing it? I grew up in an immigrant household and I just thought you kind of fall into whatever path your family has fallen into. If mm -hmm. you were born into money, you were going to have money. Mm -hmm. If you were born into middle class, you were going to stay middle class. Yeah. I didn't know you could opt out and you could graduate <laughs> yeah. from that. Yeah. And so that was a big mental shift for me to go, yeah, payments are normal and being in debt is normal, but normal sucks. Normal is broke. How do I get out of this? And right. so Ramsey Solutions intersected my life in 2013. I got an internship here working for Dave at this company. And that's when I went through Financial Peace University. And this kind of, it was I was unveiled of this money matrix that exists in America today, the consumerism, yeah. the payments, how it's all normal and a way to opt out. And so it started with Dave's baby steps, thousand dollar starter emergency fund, tackle all of your debts using the debt snowball, get a full emergency fund in place, begin investing. And so that's what I did. In 18 months, I paid off my $40,000 in consumer debt, the wow. student loans, the credit card debt. I knocked it out with side hustles and living on less than I made and sacrifices. And that was a huge milestone for me. Did you think that that would be possible for you back 10 years ago that you could be a millionaire? It never occurred to me. It wasn't a thing where I was like, I could be a millionaire. It was just one of those, I want to get out of debt. And once you're out of debt, it was, yeah. I want to build an emergency fund. And then it was, I want to invest 15% into my 401k. And so over time, a natural byproduct was wealth. Did you, but as a kid though, or growing up, did you ever have this like aspiration of, I want to be rich one day? Oh yeah. 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 I was very, I mean, my dad, I remember growing up at church and my dad would give me a dollar to go up to people and say things to them in Arabic to try to get them to laugh. And once I figured out how to make money, I was like, this is a life hack. Because uh, as, as a kid, money was like this magical object that was yeah. hard to obtain, except for birthdays and Christmas. Right. And so once you figure out how to make some, you go, what could this turn into? What could this be one day? And we all dreamt about being astronauts and rock stars and millionaires. But again, I never thought it would actually happen in my lifetime. But is there a point where you thought that dream was crushed? That like, as a kid, yeah, I want to be rich. And then was there a time where you're like, it's not possible for me. I'm just going to be stuck in this this payments game. I'm just going to be okay getting by like everybody else. Was What was that point like? That was in 2013 when I graduated college and you were told, like, go to school, get the degree, and there's going to be a job. In? I got a degree in communication, communication, a bachelor in communication from a small uh, school in Mobile, Alabama is where I finished. Grew up in Boston, migrated down to Mobile, finished school finally and went, I'll figure it out. I yeah. was a musician. I was kind of a marketing, social media, tech savvy guy. I loved film. Yeah. So I was all over the place as a creative. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and so st coming out of college, I just thought, well, where's my job now? Someone's supposed to give me a job, right? Didn't work like that. Yeah. And there was no magic six-figure salary at the end of the college degree rainbow. Yeah. Like you were kind of promised. Well, especially with a communications degree, that can be a lot tougher. Yeah. And so I was, you know, we, we always joke that I'm now communicating for a living. So <laughs> I, I actually use my degree. But for a lot of people, you're just sort of hoping and guessing that 
this is the right degree and you're going to have a job that you love at the end of it that pays really well. So I didn't plan very well. Sure. Obviously, I took out a bunch of student loans to make this happen. Yeah. And so coming out of college, I was frustrated. I was mm-hmm. anxious. I, I was There was a depression that was just like a cynicism toward adulthood because I felt like I was lied to. Yeah. They were. T- I was told, go- follow this path and your mm-hmm. life's going to be great. And it, it wasn't. I was stressed. So now for somebody listening to this who maybe doesn't have the luxury to be working with Dave Ramsey, if you're, you know, whether you're broke, you're in debt, or you're starting your wealth journey, what are the most important things? What are the three most important things that somebody should be doing right now to start building their wealth? Because there's a lot of crazy things happening in the economy. People are worried about that. People are worried that, oh my God, inflation has made spending so much more like difficult that I don't have any money to save. Like, what are the most important things that somebody should be doing today? Mm. Well, if we took a call on the Ramsey show and someone goes, I'm just getting started. I have no clue where to go. I want to build wealth. The first thing we do is we look at reality because a lot of times finance involves emotion mm-hmm. and we're stressed out. And so when in, anytime someone's emotional, I try to guide them to the reality and the numbers mm. to help them go, here's what's actually happening. You make $60,000. You have twenty thousand dollars in debt. This is a simple math equation, yeah. uh, as far as paying this off. We have to come up with five thousand dollars for four months, and we're done. Mm. And so that helps me to go. How much margin do I need to accomplish this goal? So the first step I tell people is to make a written budget. And mm. we have an app called Every Dollar that makes this really easy. You type in your income, you type in all of your expenses, and that will show you exactly if you're going to be in the red every month yeah. or if you have money left that you can be throwing at your debt. And so the budget is the foundation that the baby step sits on. And once you're budgeting, that's when we go, we got to get away from debt. Debt is stealing from our income. Mm-hmm. It's a thief taken from our paycheck and our margin and our options. And the other thing is having savings. Four in 10 have nothing in savings. And so that hurts people because what happens when an emergency comes up? Yeah. They go back into debt. They swipe the card. They take on a 401k loan. So budgeting living on less than you make and having that savings cushion, that to me is the ultimate financial foundation. Because then you're going to have the margin to invest and do all the things you want to do. But what about the worries that people have about potentially the market crashing? I'm going to put my money into the stock market and it's at a peak. Markets are going to crash and I'm going to lose 50% of my money in in six months. Mm. How does somebody get over those fears? I think looking at history and data and facts uh, helps versus looking at headlines and what could be and remember that one thing that happened back there. Mm. When you look at the long-term track record of the you know American economy and the U.S. stock market, it's very encouraging to me. Mm. You don't have to be a, a financial prodigy. You can be a five-year-old and see the line does this. And over time, it keeps going up and up and up if you just leave it alone. We're going to jump back into the show in just a minute. But first, here's an advertisement from our sponsor, me with Briefs Media. If you're looking for an easy way to stay up to date on what's happening in the top finance and business news, we make it super easy for you to do that at Briefs Media because we created a free newsletter called Market Briefs. Market Briefs is a super simple and easy way for you to stay up to date on the top finance and business news. You can read Market Briefs in less than five minutes every morning. It's a fun and witty and easy to read newsletter. And I promise if you join Market Briefs, you are going to love it. Now you might say, just breathe. how can you promise that I'm going to love Market Briefs? Well, if you don't love Market Briefs, you can unsubscribe at any time because it's completely free. So if you have not joined Market Briefs yet and you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the top finance and business news, I got the link to how you can join Market Briefs down in the description below. Or you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. And with that, let's go back to the show. But are you worried about the markets crashing at all? I'm personally not worried. Um, And I, I think... Every generation has had this fear. And every time I go, what are your inputs? Where are you hearing this from? Mm. Well, I watched this headline from the media, which wants my eyeballs and attention. And I heard from my friend yeah. that I should pull all of my money out. Or my, my, my insurance person said I should be investing in this whole life insurance too, <laughs> because that's the hedge. And so yeah. I go, what are your inputs? What are the real facts? And the chances of the entire U.S. stock market going to zero, which is what we're really talking about when you say I'm going to lose all my money in the stock market. Mm -hmm. The chances of that are so abysmally low that I feel very comfortable with people investing in the stock market. And and I think what you're saying is so important to your strategy for investing, because you're right. If you put your money into the stock market for you to actually lose all your money, the stock market's got to go to zero. But I think a couple mistakes that people make, uh, maybe you'll disagree with me or you can agree, is number one, people will invest money they shouldn't be investing, they can't afford to, or number two is they're putting their money where they 
don't understand. You're putting your money into individual stocks that you don't know how to analyze. You're putting your money into meme stocks, or you put your money into the next Sears. That oh gosh, right? You don't need the entire market to collapse, but you see your money go to zero. So yeah. That's oh. where people get burned is when they jump into single stocks and they try to get fancy with some of these options and margin. And I'm like, dude, just put your money into the S&P 500, the mm -hmm. overall stock market, the biggest companies in America that we're all rooting for, yeah. that have a track record of winning, and you'll be okay. And so that's what I do personally with my 401k. It's yeah. diversified across four types of mutual funds, growth, growth and income, aggressive growth, and international. It's that simple. If you're well diversified and you have you know, international as a little hedge, it's hard to even look at a period of time where your your investment portfolio is taking a huge dip. Yeah. And even if it does, I'm 34. I'm not planning on touching that money until uh, I'm 60. Yeah, I think that's a big thing though, right? It's you understand that if the market dips, it has time to recover. Versus, I was I was getting my oil changed recently, um, and I go to the oil change spot, and the guy know knows who I am, and he was talking to me about his investments. He said, like, you know. Uh, I uh, put some money into the stock market, but it didn't really do anything. And so I put my money into a crypto and I saw it like grow by, you know, a huge percentage in a short period of time. So, you know, I'm, I'm not really big on putting my money in the stocks because He's of that. He's done with the stock market. And I was like, well, how long did you have it in there? He's like, oh, I think I had it about three months. And I think that is a very common perception because every, like, for example, stock brokerages being accessible to people is a double-edged sword. It's great that people can get access to investing, but it can also be bad because when you look at it every single day, it's very hard to have that long-term mindset when it comes to investing. And so my question then was like, how do you train your mind in a fast food culture and mm. I want everything today culture and I want to get rich today? How does somebody who's listening to this understand, dude, you got to chill out for it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever happens in the next six years doesn't really matter. That's a great question. I wrote a whole chapter in my new book called Wealth is Patience. That's my thesis. I like that. I like and that. I, I make the analogy of, you know, we, we live in this microwave culture where we have to be crockpots. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to do. People <laughs> like look that. at you like you're crazy. Right. To, when you're the tortoise in a world full of hares, everyone's like, dude, what are you doing? You're going so slow. Yeah. What do you mean you invest in your 401k and you're you're just happy and peaceful with that? You know, they think I should be doing something fancier and moving faster and building wealth at a faster rate. And so a lot of it comes down to um, perspective and being okay with your own financial journey and putting the blinders on, not yeah. comparing yourself to others. Because I go, what are you trying to move faster for? You know, we have 19 year olds that call into the show and they go, how do I make, how do I turn my 100,000 into a million in five years? And I go, what's your goal with that? I don't know. I just feel like I need, I should be building wealth faster because th there's this just, stress that, that I, time is running out for me to build wealth. And I go, what would you do if you got everything you dreamed of? And then what? You have a million dollars and then what? Well, and then I'd buy the thing. Okay, then what? Yeah. And then what? And you keep asking those questions. Turns out no one's really thought through what the next 30 years really looks like. They're just chasing the next dollar. Yeah, that's so right. And I think social media makes that difficult because you constantly see people having the nice cars, flying first class, flying the private jet and having all these things. And you're like, dude, this guy's 26 and he's got X, Y, and Z. He's, got the, he's flying in a private jet, going to a private island. But I think a lot of people miss the broader picture there where, first off, are they actually affording that? Because that was something I learned the hard way. Because when I was younger, I dreamed of having a BMW i8, mm. which, you know, when it was on the market, was probably $130,000 off the lot, which is expensive. Yeah. And I would see these guys talking about, oh, dude, I'm making six figures a year. Look at me. I got this BMW i8. And then I was like, dude, that's a lot. That's so cool. And then when I got to the point where I could comfortably afford the BMW i8 and not have to worry about the price, my want for that car went way down here. Like when I couldn't afford it, my want was way up here. Yeah. When I could afford it, it went way down here. And I was like, wait, I can afford it, but I really don't think I should buy it. I really don't think I can actually afford it because... My wealth needs more money right now. Yeah. And I think that's such a, it's a tough pill to swallow because a lot of people assume that, dude, you got to make this money. Everybody's making this money so you can live this lifestyle, so you can find a spouse, a husband or a wife. And it just gets into this whole toxic mentality as opposed to being complacent, but also understanding. Like, I don't want people to be like, oh, I should be okay where I am. But also understanding that there's a journey and the journey is where the real wealth is built. Yeah. And I think part of that is, you know, a lot of young single guys out there in particular, 
which are the ones that generally watch channels like ours on YouTube, there's this this chasing of wealth. And in no other time in history have we seen where a 19-year-old can just go make a million dollars. Yeah. Like 10, 20 years ago, that didn't exist. Right. Now we're seeing people all over with content creators and YouTubers and all kinds of, you know, all this entrepreneurship uh, push. People can make a lot of money, but they can also spend a lot of money. And that's what we're seeing is lifestyle creep happens. And uh, it, what's very humbling is getting married and having a kid. That will change your priorities in the best way. Yeah. To where you don't have to, what, like, what are we flexing for? You know, the only person I care about impressing is my wife at this point, and she's not impressed. And so it's a very, <laughs> it's so freeing. I'm like, who cares what kind of car I drive? Like, yeah. I drove a Honda, a 09 Honda Civic. The bumper's, you know, half hang, fallen off the thing. Dave Ramsey's making fun of me. And I went, I have priorities. I'm trying to pay off the house. Then I'll upgrade in car. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And I have no regrets with my financial plan. And I didn't care what anyone thought about my plan. And I think that's so interesting because now you are this internet celebrity. You're this guy that's got so many followers. You're sitting on stage with Dave Ramsey talking all this stuff. You've built all this wealth. You've got this best-selling book. And yet you're saying, you know, I know you said it as a joke, but, you know, my wife's not impressed. What matters to your wife? As mm. this guy is financially, uh, financially successful, like what is important to you and your wife in your relationship? What would yeah. you say are the most important things? Well, you know, she works at Ramsey. So we're very aligned with our values, which is a beautiful thing. A lot yeah. of couples, that takes a long time just to get on the same page. And so what she really values now is how present I am at home, mm. how helpful I am with our five-month-old baby girl. That's what matters. You know, it's not what cars we drive. We just bought my wife uh, a new-to-us car. Mm. It's the nicest car we've ever owned. It about hurt my soul to write that check. <laughs> but we're at a place where it's not a big part of our world. Yeah. We're going to pay cash. And again, it didn't change our life. It didn't change who we were. And we're not doing it to impress anyone. And so, so I think that... The motive needs to change over time as you mature. But because I think a lot of single guys kind of might not understand this. If you now brought home, let's say, a $100,000 check for your wife, but you weren't present, mm. you weren't being the man in the relationship, you weren't being the supporting father, would that $100,000 cover what you're doing? Well, uh, you know, we've seen the movies where the, where the father tries to, like, buy the daughter's love and all she wants is, like, the hug and the quality time. And so... I think there's there. It's a trope, but it's true that you know the the quality of your life uh, has very little to do with money. Now, money problems will be an obstacle to mm -hmm. the quality of your life, but at a certain threshold, money is just a tool, and it can't create. It can't give you character. It can't give you integrity. It can't give you a great marriage. Mm -hmm. And we see that all the time. People that have tons of money get divorced and have terrible marriages and have their kids hate them. <sighs> and so I think it's a beautiful thing where you go. The money is just amoral. Yeah. It can't change you. Um, and so I think seeing it through the lens of, you know, I'm a steward of this money. I want to be a good manager of it. I want to use it to be a blessing to my family, my community, the people around me. That just is a much healthier view versus what could I buy with this stuff that could be a flex that could impress people. Yeah. My friends don't care. Half my friends work here. They for sure don't care. <laughs> but what about now if you're in the dating scene, if you're trying to find your wife or your girlfriend? Because this is what I hear from a lot of my single friends. Dude, you got to make money if you want to get a girl because then you know no one's going to want to come into a Toyota Camry. Oh, my gosh. this yeah, That's a funny one because when I first started dating my wife, I opened the door for her not really out of chivalry but because like I didn't have automatic locks. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, I still had the roll-up windows yeah, on my yeah, Chevy yeah. Cobalt when yeah. we were dating. Yeah. And so I think if you find the right woman, she's not concerned. And if you do find the woman who's only concerned about what you've got, you are marrying the wrong woman. Mm -hmm. Unless that's the kind of person you both are and that you want to live that life of you both flex for the rest of your life, I've never seen a 50-year marriage where that was the case. The successful marriages are always people who are level-headed with the same values who are not trying to impress the people around them. I love that. And you know those things go so much further because there's a guy who's in my friend circle who about two years after his marriage was telling me that he was almost done paying off his wedding ring. Two years into his wedding, into his marriage. Oh and my God. I was like, are you serious? And it, it, it creates such a toxic... Uh, root like if, if you're thinking about building like a plant or, or watering a plant if it starts off toxic it's just going to keep going more and more toxic and now you know you start financing your appliances you're living in a home you can't afford you got to have the cars and and from an economic perspective that's okay when markets are good and you keep having your income but as soon as somebody loses their job 
you can't go to work, something goes wrong, now everything starts to just Your crumble. Your life implodes. It's a house of cards. And I'm sure you've probably seen a lot of that on, on uh, the Ramsey Show and just the calls, the callers that call in. We're going to jump back into the show in just a minute, but before we do, here are a few words from our sponsor, M1. If you've been watching my videos, you've probably heard of me talk about passively investing your money in the stock market where you have a CPA, a consistent, passive, and automatic system where money is automatically invested into the stock market for you. Well, a super easy-to-use platform that can help you passively invest your money into the stock market is M1. And as a little disclaimer, at the time of me recording this video, M1 is a tool that I use to passively invest my money into my portfolio of ETFs. The way it works is you get to create your pie or your portfolio of ETFs or stocks that you want to invest in, and then you can create a cadence of how often you want to invest into this portfolio of ETFs or stocks. For me, I invest every Wednesday. You can invest every two weeks, every month, but once you pick the cadence, you set it and forget it, and M1 is completely free for you to use. Now, of course, investing has risks. Are you guaranteed to make money when you invest? No, of course not. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point, which is why you want to always do own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube, but you can mitigate some of your risk by investing your money into good assets for the long term, which is why I invest my money into my portfolio of ETFs, whether the market's up and down because I'm investing for the long term. Now, of course, you want to do your own research, get a financial advisor if you need one, but M1 is a great tool that can allow you to passively invest your money yourself. Minority Mindset is a paid partner with M1, meaning if you use them, we will get compensated, but there's no additional cost to you. So if you want to learn more and create a free account with M1, I got the link to hiking do that down in the description below, or you can go to the minoritymindset.com slash M1. That's the minoritymindset.com slash the letter M and the number one. And with that, let's go back to the show. So how do you then guide somebody who's in that? Because I'm sure somebody watching this is in a situation where it's like, dude, I'm in credit card debt. I'm in all this tough, like, how, what do you do? Like, how do you get out of that? Well, the people that call in, we always have a gauge of, are they ready? Are, are they at that point where they're like, I've had it? And you can tell. You can tell in the tone of their voice. You can tell in their responses to our questions um, exactly what if they're going to take the advice or not. Yeah. And for some people, you know, our advice falls on some rocky soil, and it's not going to take root. And for some people, you can tell they're like, no, I'm ready. I'm, I, yeah, I'm willing to sell the car. That's when we're like, all right, game on. There yeah. is hope for you yet if you've had that I've had it moment and you're done because you're like, I work too hard to feel this broke. I'm willing to make those deep sacrifices for a short period of time. Those are the people that inspire me, and that's yeah. when transformation happens. But when people call in and they want to argue about a spread on an interest rate, I'm like, bro, I got people to help. I, yeah. Like, t Save that for a Reddit thread. Like, We have people who actually want to build wealth. Yeah. They're ready to not play the game of a toxic money culture that is saying – Debt is the path. This is the way to do it. You got to get 16 credit cards and maximize your rewards. Yeah. That's We're going to beat the system. And I'm going, no, you got to buck the system. It's way more peaceful, and it's a much more simpler life. And that's why I'm very content with my path. Even if I don't have a $22 million net worth at 34, I don't freaking care. <laughs> well, what's, what would you say is the craziest call that you've gotten on the Ramsey Show that you were on? Oh, man. Okay, well, this one... There was a guy who called in. I want your take on this mm. because people said I'm, un I'm uncultured. I don't understand the culture. I'm insensitive to the culture. Indian guy calls in, lives in New York, uh, lives at, at home with his family, and he goes, hey, uh, I, I'm going to pay for my own wedding. I don't want to ask my family. It's going to cost $500,000. Mm. And so I was like, dude, do not do this. You don't have the money to do this. And if you're going to have a nice wedding and your parents expect this from you, they better be willing to chip in and they need to cover it. Like, this is not on you if you're planning on doing this. And so that was a wild one to just, like half a million dollars <laughs> on a party hurts my brain for one person to take on as sort of a, a, a flex is what it felt like. Like everyone wants to have a fancy wedding. Yeah, We all want that dream wedding. But when you don't have the money, going into debt for a wedding boggles my mind. And it's very interesting you bring that up because the Indian wedding business is a very, very lucrative business. And I'm saying this from experience because I used to work at that industry. Yeah. It is very common for Indians to spend six figures or multi-six figures for their wedding. And as a guy, one of the most impressive things that you can do is say, I'm going to pay for my wedding because that's what I told my parents when I was younger. I didn't know how I was going to do it, that I was going to pay for my wedding because in uh, Indian culture, Indians spend money, traditional Indian culture, on two things, your wedding and your education. 
Mm. Everything else you don't spend money on. Uh, but that wedding, there's a whole new business today of people providing loans to Indian parents trying to get their kids married. Oh wow! And and it is very 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 I say bad because I never would recommend anybody in any circumstance to go into debt for any part of their wedding. I mean, Ever. this is a second mortgage. These are big numbers. These are huge numbers. But the thing is, your mortgage at least has some collateral. Your yeah. house, you have there's, no there's collateral. There's an asset there. There's, there's not no, a party that disappears. There's no collateral that people forgot the about. Wedding. And so, you know, we, my wife and I had a very nice wedding. It was in the six figures. Um, but I was very fortunate that we were able to pay for it with cash. And we had already budgeted for it. Like, I started saving for my wedding when I was a lot younger, before I had even met my wife. Yeah. So because I knew, you knew. I knew that was something that I wanted to do. But if somebody now says, I'm going to pay for my wedding, and I don't got the money for it. Like I see where they're coming from because their mindset is, I want to give back to my mom and dad because I saw them break their back and I don't want them to pay for it. Yeah. But then dude, don't have a half a million dollar wedding. Yes. That's where I was like, can you not do a cheaper wedding? Like I, I know that's... There, that those exist, but I that hurt my brain to like wrap my head around it. And I understand there's a lot of cultural traditions. Those are the hardest ones to break through. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, you talk about keeping up with the Joneses or, or whatever that saying is. Um, in the Indian wedding space, it is so lucrative. And I'll tell you because I am some of my best friends are vendors in the Indian wedding space. So they're videographers, they're DJs, they're whatever uh, different event planners. And they love the idea of wedding comparison. They love when we can Instagram your wedding and show it to our new uh, brides and grooms. Now she's jealous. Like, I need that. Exactly. Those guys. It is the best selling pitch Great because marketing. now they're going to say, what is the bride and groom going to say? We want something no one else has done before. Well, look, we've done this. We can do X, Y, and Z. There's no always a one-upping. There's always oh one-upping. Oh, my gosh. And this is the best selling pitch for the wedding vendors because now what do you do? Instead of charging 10000 we can charge $13,000. And that's over the last few years caused these wedding costs to just skyrocket because now it's, it's you don't want to look like everybody else on Instagram. Come on, don't you want to go viral? You got to do something different. Wow. And good people will pay for it as long as people pay for it. And now even if you can't pay for it, do you, do you need a loan? This company this is right exactly here. Exactly how college tuition got out of control. The student loan companies were like, "We'll get you," and then the colleges were like, "We'll raise the price. They'll just borrow more money." The same thing's happening in all kinds of industries. It is, it is uh, horrible. And until we can, you know, going back to what you said in the very beginning of this, that mindset shift, until you can get into that mindset of, dude, this wedding's going to last in Indian culture a week, maybe two weeks. <laughs> After these two weeks are over, you all you're left with is the bills. Yep. And that's it. So now it's, do you want to be left with that bill? Or can you say, you know what? Let's maybe not have all those crazy decorations and let's have a five-year anniversary party when we can afford it. Let's do a, a something else when we can afford Some it. Compromise. And that is tough, dude. Yeah. Because when you see all your friends doing it, when you see everybody on Instagram doing it, it is hard. And I'm speaking from the Indian culture because I see it every day because all my friends are my Have close friends. Have you been friends. to a like a, a $10,000 Indian wedding? Is that a, like I have people done I, it very to, modestly? I, I, uh, I would say modest. Yeah, I've been to a sub twenty thousand dollar wedding uh, because here's the thing: an intimate Indian wedding with your closest family would be like two hundred fifty people. Yeah, so that's your small intimate. That's intimate. Intimate. Because Indian weddings are like, well, I'm gonna invite every single person I know plus 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 the neighbors plus the neighbors' family relatives and the dog and the, and the, and the yeah, dog. Yeah, so that that's kind of hear me say, I want to go to one of these weddings. So please invite me if you're out there. Like, throw me an invite because this sounds like such an epic party. They are, they are. I mean, it's very beautiful. There's a lot of traditions involved, um, but they are expensive, and. Um, yeah, so it's crazy that you say that because it is... Well, if someone said, hey, George, I want to buy a $500,000 car. I don't have the money. I'd go, don't do it. But when it's a wedding, somehow it feels like you can justify it. But So that's the hardest part. I, no, I'm on board with you. If you don't... I follow what's called the rule of five. My rule is if, you, if it's when it comes to liabilities that you don't need to survive, if you can't buy five of them, you can't afford one of them. Ooh. You want a half a million dollar wedding? Who? Cool. You better have two point five million dollars. You better, yes. you know what I mean. Like I, I have. Because then it's a thing of ratios. It's like it's it a is. small part of your world. At it that is, point. and that's just like, dude. I have no. I I uh, make fun of Gucci all the time, right? Because I have nothing wrong with Gucci. I don't wear it. I'm not a huge fan of it. But if you want Gucci, cool. But you better afford the Gucci first. Yeah. 
And I that's just the most people walking through at Gucci at the mall, they're middle class. They are. And they're not they're putting it on the credit card and they're getting their 2% back in rewards thinking they're winning somehow. Well, let's talk about credit cards cuz uh, you know, you I showed you my wallet a little bit earlier yes. and you were You have the, like a straight up George Costanza <laughs> wallet. Like are you sitting on it right now? I'm not. I put it over there because I'd be sitting like this. Yeah. I, I always put my wallet in my front pocket because actually I saw Seinfeld that episode of George Costanza having his wallet in his back pocket. Yeah. And he used to have back issues. I started having those back issues. So I was like, oh, I realized I don't need to go to the doctor. My dad's got the same wallet. He has he has a receipt from like 1994 in there just in case he needs to make the return. Like, really? I don't know what it is. I used to have a newspaper article cutting in my wallet. Was I don't it from the, you? Well, you were it was in the one article? of mine's, yeah. Respect. I don't have that anymore. I, I, you should have framed it. It's I should have, yeah. Get destroyed. Well, but yeah, my wallet is so simple that uh, people make fun of me for it. I have a, a debit card and my license. That's it. But why a debit card, man? Why not a credit card? Oh... Come on. I played that game. I had the Amex, Delta, Sky Miles card. Okay. I had the Discover cash back card for students or whatever and like rotating cash back and I would see what Discover. It was like, oh, if you eat out this month, you'll get 5% cash back. It's like, well, let's go eat out. Sure. That is the psychology of spending when it comes to these credit card companies. They are smarter than us. And so over time, I realized, what the heck is a Sky Mile? And what am I doing going out to spend money at Outback Steakhouse to get my 5% cash back when I'm broke? Mm. So I ended up cutting up the cards after going through Financial Peace University. And you I actually never physically cut it up. Physically cut it up with scissors. And it was so, it was emotional. It was freeing because credit cards, I found, it's like sentimental. It's like, well, this is the first card I opened when I was 18 and I put this purchase on it. And I'm like, why are we emotional over a piece of plastic? Mm. I even asked a girl the other day, we were downtown, did a man on the street, and I was like, what cards do you have? She said, I got the Apple card. I said, why'd you get it? I saw my dad with it, and it was a cool metal card. Mm. These are the reasons people are getting cards now. It's, there's really no utility, and when I asked them what they actually got in cash back, they either can't tell me, or it's a bunch of random points, they have no clue what they're actual valued at, yeah. and if they do tell me an amount, I go, all right, you know, I was talking to my friend Graham Stephan, right? You know Graham. Yeah. And I'm like, how much did you get in rewards last year? He's like, probably $2,000. I'm like, Graham, you make millions of dollars. Like, you're playing this game for $2,000. He's like, I just like the game. Like, he's just a nerd and he likes playing this sure. game. But financially, there is no benefit for Graham to even play that game, other than the, the tiny joy he gets out of trying to maximize the rewards. But you're smart with your money, right? You're good with your money. I'd like to think so. No, you are. You're good with your money. And if you walked into the mall today, you walked into the Gucci store, and whether you had 100 credit cards in one pocket or not, I don't think you're going to buy something that you couldn't or shouldn't. So for someone like you who is financially smart, who knows how to control their spending, who is not going to be impulsed or pushed to buy something you can't, don't you think that if you had to, if you had to make a $1,000 purchase, why not get the, you know, percent to two percent back man you know if we were back in like the garden of eden and everything was great i would be like yeah let's do it everyone yeah. credit cards will be okay i just know myself i know human psychology i am a fallible creature who is bound to screw it up and mm. make an emotional purchase and i found that with a debit card it is physically impossible to go into debt even if i wanted to my bank's gonna it's gonna go and eh, you don't have the money for that purchase and i think bringing back friction into a world that has become so comfortable and so instant gratification is a beautiful thing and a mature thing when we go, here's the friction. You don't have the money right now and mm -hmm. you can't see you can't stomach seeing it leave your bank account right now. Don't make the purchase. So that's how I see it. When I use, even cash is the ultimate because you feel that. Yeah, you know, if we if you go to the the grocery store and you put out two hundred dollar bills to pay for two hundred bucks of groceries, you'll throw up. Mm. On the credit card, now we don't even have to swipe. You just hold your phone out, you tap to pay, and you take that card back, and it feels like nothing happened. And we'll worry about it later. Hopefully, we can make the payment at the end of the month. And we know that half the people can't pay the balance in full. Hmm. And so if there was a 50-50 chance of you getting screwed, I'm not playing that game. You know, that's how people get screwed in Vegas, at the blackjack table sure. or roulette. And so I found that credit card companies uh, have never been a blessing to me. It's not worth the one free flight I'd get a year. And to you'd have to spend an astronomical amount to see any meaningful rewards. And so to me, just looking at basic mathematics, human psychology, and my own personal peace and anxiety, I just live a simpler, more peaceful life without it. What if somebody is, let's just say, they have um, $100,000 in fixed expenses for, let's say, a business owner. 
you have advertising costs, software costs, you know this money is going to leave your bank account. If you put it on your debit card, the money's going to leave. If you put it on your credit card, the money's going to leave. But you'll get upgrades on your flights, you'll get uh, upgrades on your hotel, and you'll get some extra cash back. Still? Mm. You know, I have more empathy for business owners who th think that way. But I do think if I ran the business, I would still make better decisions mm. if it was the business checking account and that money was coming out. And I did the math and I was like, do we have to spend 100 grand? I bet we could do 95 grand this year mm. versus we'll spend 100 grand, we'll get 2,000 back. I'll get an upgrade. I'm a man of the people. I fly Southwest. There's no upgrades. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so to me, like the upgrades are usually a bit of a flex. There's some luxury yeah. and convenience. And uh, I've just never found them to be worth it. And I found the most successful business owners that I look up to, they run their business debt free. Mm. They use business debit cards. We have a whole branch of, here called Entree Leadership where yeah. we show people how to do business the Ramsey way, how yeah. Dave built this place. And we only have business debit cards here at Ramsey. Mm. There's not a single credit card laying around this place. Wow. And Dave built this place at the speed of cash. He got burned doing it with debt. And uh, after digging into how the credit card companies operate. I unpacked this. I want to hear after you read the credit card chapter in my book. It was mind boggling the amount of experiments these companies run every single year. Hmm. I talked to an ex Capital One manager who told me 10,000 experiments to confuse consumers into spending more, to switch from cash back to points and miles and how it can be devalued at any time and MIT research showing the psychology of the card swiping. So I've just found for most people that are not just spree, it's unwise because you're going to get burnt. Like you have to be so meticulous. Sure. And I didn't want to play that game. Yeah. It's too much mental brain calories for me at this stage. And I, I could see that, especially to some extent, like uh, I, I use credit cards. I love using credit cards. And I have seen in some instances where I will spend more on a credit card. And the reason why is because, so for example, I have uh, one of the Amex cards. And Amex has this thing called the Fine Hotels uh, Collection or whatever, where if you stay in these nice hotels, they give you some extra perks. And growing up, <clears throat> when I used to go to a hotel, a hotel was the cheapest room possible. The Howard oh, Inn, yeah. let's put as many people into the Howard into the Red the Roof Inn as Western possible. Best Western was luxury for us. I was like, we're in a Best Western, baby. <laughs> if I, the first night I was in Nashville, I stayed at the Best Western. Yes. So, But, you know, uh, I, my, when I got married, my wife likes uh, certain luxuries a lot more than I do. And one of those things was she likes staying in nicer hotels. And I'm not going to lie, I've started to kind of develop that taste too. Because once you start once sleeping you, in the nicer... Once you taste it. Unfortunately, uh, that's, that's true. You can't go back yeah, it's to much the Hilton tougher. Garden Inn. It's not happening. It, it's tougher. And so my wife and I, we started going to a couple of the MX uh, fine hotels. And they cost a little bit more, but it's a very different experience. These are very nice hotels. And now, you know, when we go places, my wife will ask, you know, so do you want to get one of these fine hotels? And so, yes, <clears throat> I would agree. We pay so more you're money. You're spending more for the hotel. We're spending you're more for the perks hotel. Back, we're getting perks back, but I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm upset that we're staying there because we're paying for an experience, right? And it's something again that we're comfortable paying for. It's not something that's stretching us financially. It's not something that's pushing us. But I do see what you're saying. That yeah, if I didn't know about these fine hotels, I'd probably still be at the Holiday Inn Express or the Best Western. You know, it's it's more of like a wow, I learned about this or, or this cash back. Which brings me to the next thing I want to ask you is what would you say are some of the worst financial mistakes that Americans are making today that is keeping them broke? And I think I know the first one you're going to oh, say. Oh, man. But well, truthfully, number one right now in my mind as we take calls is car loans. Car loans. Car loans are killing Americans. And it's the it's number one video I did on YouTube. Um, I think it's approaching like a million views now. Wow. And, it was called America's number one wealth killer. And it was all about the car loan. And I broke down um, you know, how depreciation works and how this actually works when you're paying interest on a, something going down in value. So that when you, you buy a $40,000 car, after interest and the length of the loan is over, you paid yeah. 50 for that. So an Ooh. extra 10 grand in interest. Well, the car is now worth 16 or 20 grand. <laughs> and I'm like, so more and more people, almost every person that calls the Ramsey Show lately calls in and they say, hey, my car is worth 20, I owe 35. I'm underwater on my car. Oh. Here's a crazy one. This couple called in and said, hey, we've, we decided to try to do Turo as a side hustle where we rent out cars for everyday people to rent through the app. Well, they leveraged three vehicles on loans that are now all three underwater. Ooh. So the car is worth 20, they owe 35. 
The car is worth 30, they owe 45. Oh my God. And they're underwater on all three and they're like, how do we get out of this? And I'm like, well, you need the difference in cash or you need the difference in a loan in order to even sell that car. And so these are really scary situations and most people are driving their retirement accounts with the amount of car they're buying. Hmm. And just like college tuition, guess what happens? Car prices go up, yeah. people still buy them because of loans. If we had to only buy cars with cash, car prices would plummet because no one would be buying $50,000 cars that they couldn't afford. But people need a car to get to and from work. Do they need a $50,000 car to get to and from work? Uh, Most people would say, well, it's safety and reliability. I can't be you know, driving a 2007 vehicle. It would crash. That Once it hits 100,000 miles, you throw them away and you get new ones. Yeah. That's how most people think. And so you know this because you drive an older vehicle. <laughs> I drive an older vehicle. Yeah. Uh, and we're both millionaires. And we still are like, this is not a wise way to spend your money. <laughs> and so I find most people are broke because of their cars. They're hanging on to student loans uh, for 10, 20 years, hoping for government forgiveness. Mm. They are have credit card balances because life got it crazy, inflation, everything's expensive. So how do they keep up their life? Swiping the card. So now they're carrying a credit card balance and now they're turning to personal loans. We've seen a record number of HELOCs as people have their home value appreciate with this housing market. They're like, sweet, we have an extra hundred grand on our home. Let's use that as a line of credit and go fund the renovation and the vacation yeah. and the yeah. kids' college. And so we're seeing all of these mistakes compound and stack on each other and it's heartbreaking. So I guess if, if it's the opposite now, somebody let's say they've paid down the credit card debt, they don't have an auto loan, when is it and how is it okay for somebody to splurge? Because mm -hmm. I'm of the opinion that if you have the money and you want to buy something, go ahead and do it. Is that, I mean, wh what are your thoughts on splurging? Well, you know, in the Ramsey plan, when you look at baby steps one through seven, well, baby steps one through three, we are getting out of debt and getting a fully funded emergency in place. Sure. That You got to be intense and sacrifice hard for a short period of time. Most people do all of those in two and a half years. Wow. They pay off their debt in 18 to 24 months. Amazing. The fully, emer fully, fully funded emergency fund in about Which six to 12 months. so important yeah. to build that financial foundation. So two and a half to three years, you don't have payments and you got a big pile of money in the bank. That's when we say move from intense to intentional. Now it's the time to upgrade the car and you can go on vacation and we're doing this all with cash. Mm -hmm. And so the time to quote splurge, it's hard. I almost want to like reframe what splurge means because it feels like you're doing something you shouldn't be. It does. Versus it does. What we do is we put it in the budget. So a $10,000 vacation might feel like a splurge, but when it's in the budget, it just becomes a thing we get to do. Ah. And so I like reframing the, the idea of splurging because splurging feels like spending money we don't have. That's true. You know, but I still understand because there's things I splurge on, like a $300 concert yeah, recently. I'm that was a big splurge for me. Yeah. Because it's money that normally I wouldn't spend, but my wife is like, this is your favorite band of all time. Just go to the concert, yeah. you'll have a great time. And now it's worth it to me. So, but I had to loosen up a little bit, honestly, because when you follow the Ramsey plan and you build those You're muscles tight. of not spending, yeah. it's hard to then let loose and go, oh, we've earned it. Yeah. So people will call on the show and they're like, we're at baby step seven. We don't have a mortgage payment. We have a million dollars in our retirement fund. Can we go on a $5,000 vacation paid mm -hmm. for in cash? We're like, yes. Can I buy the $30,000 car? We make 250,000 we have no debt. Yes, buy the car. <laughs> we tell people not to do that when they're buying a $40,000 car and they make 50,000 and they're drowning right. in payments. Yeah. That's usually how it works. So I think splurging should happen once you have no consumer debt, a fully funded emergency fund, you're investing for the future, and then you have this extra money you can enjoy. So when you can afford it, it is okay to go out and buy the nice things. Exactly. People think, well, Dave's against nice stuff, rice and beans, yada, yada. I'm like, Dave's got some real nice stuff. <laughs> but for there was a period of time where he was sacrificing and he, yeah. he drove like no one else with the beater car so later, now he gets to drive whatever the flip he wants to work. His choice of vehicles, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what it's all about. It, we're not anti-stuff, we're just against stuff having you. And what about now college? Because you have a communications degree and you had to go into student loans and clearly that was very beneficial for you, the communications degree, because you're <laughs> yeah. a, a very good communicator now. Uh, if somebody now is in high school and they're watching this, they're thinking about going to college or a parent is watching this, thinking about sending the kids to high school, are student loans okay? And when are they okay? Mm. Well, I have this crazy belief that there's no such thing as good debt, which I understand is, is very controversial in the financial world. And that includes student loans. And I saw this firsthand when we were creating our Borrowed Future podcast series that I hosted. And I'm interviewing all of these people who 
have student loans and they're telling me about their experience and how they stumbled into this and all the traps they fell for and what it's held them back from doing. Mm. And the stats now show people aren't getting married, they're delaying having kids, they can't buy a home, they can't work the jobs they want, they can't live where they want, all because of this burden of student loans that they were unaware would crush their life in adulthood. So I just haven't seen it. You know, there are, I'm sure there's stories where I got the degree, I paid off the loans, and I have a great job. Those people exist. And studies do show that having that further education will give you a higher salary over the course of your life. You sure. will accumulate more income. But I don't think it's worth getting the student loans. And I think there's so many more options than people realize, than just stumbling into the one school they applied to or the alma mater their parents went to or the going for the football team or the famous name brand school. Yeah. I'm like, is it the only way? Is it the best way? That's mm -hmm. what my friend Ken Coleman says when it comes to education. And if it's the only way and it's the best way that you have to go, if to become a lawyer, you got to go to law school. Right. You're not going to watch a YouTube video and do it. But for most people, they're getting degrees. They're just hoping have a marketable job on the other side instead of thinking through it logically like a, like a business investment. So I just find that most people can go, well, we can go to the community college and cash flow that for two years, mm -hmm. knock out our prereqs, transfer to the, the four-year school, finish there at a reasonable rate. Maybe we stay in state mm -hmm. and maybe we live at home and make some sacrifices or get a part-time job or apply for grants and scholarships. All of that can help you cash flow school. And it's not impossible because people call in, they tell us their story, they're on the debt-free stage and parents are telling us how they diligently saved and how their kids worked their tails off to get those scholarships. And so it's very much possible, but just like the car, you know, if you think you'll always have a car payment, you're just gonna go get a car payment. Yeah. But when you take debt off the table when it comes to college education and you have that conversation with your kid early on and say, hey son, we are not going into debt for school. We're gonna create a plan together to help you go debt-free and get that degree that's gonna help serve you. Hmm. Parents aren't having that discussion. It's just, well, we'll take on the Parent PLUS loan. And now we have calls. This happened twice this week. Oh my God. The parent calls in, says, hey, we're trying to retire, but we can't because we owe $100,000 on my daughter's loan, Ooh. but it's a Parent PLUS loan, so it's in our name. She's not paying anymore and refuses to pay and says this the was daughter's ours. daughter's not paying anymore? Daughter's not paying. And, and she refuses says, to pay her own And says, loan. it's the parent's responsibility. They took out the loan in their name to send me to school. It shouldn't be my, and I'm like, this is a nightmare. And it's happening all over America. And so it's, it Ooh, adds so God. much pain to the relationship. It adds strain financially. And so parents don't do these Parent PLUS loans to try to get your kid a, a better life. It's not gonna give them a better life. What's the best thing a parent can do to set their kids up for success? Is it set up a trust fund for them, give them money, so get a, a set up a, you know, a investment account for them. What can a parent to do today to set their kids up for future success? Mm. Well, depending on the age of the kid and what the goal is, you know, let's say it's college. You know, as soon as my daughter was born, we set up a 529 plan. It's state specific. You can choose any state. Um, and so we set that up and started funding it. And that's a great way to help my daughter go to school debt free. If you're mm -hmm. able to, it's a wonderful thing. There's no obligation morally or financially for any parent to cover 100% of school. And it's good to have some skin in the game for your kid, mm -hmm. but don't just not plan when you have the ability to save and go, well, I want them to work for it and they'll figure it out. Mm. That's a bad plan. That's probably gonna end up with them in student loan debt. So mm. number one for college, I love a 529 plan or an education savings account. That's a great way. Tax mm. advantage, the money's gonna grow, you know, tax deferred. You can withdraw it tax free for education expenses. And now you can even roll over a portion of that money to a Roth IRA. Mm. And so it's not like they're always worried. Well, what if my kid doesn't go to school? Right. Well, what if they do and you don't have the money? You know what I mean? Like, I'm always like, yeah. I'd rather have the money and yeah. you know, change the beneficiary, worst case, to another sure. family member. So for college, that's a great plan. But everything else, it's teaching your kid that money comes from work at an early age. Don't give them allowance. Give them a commission for work they're doing. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, Dave and Rachel write about this in their book, Smart Money, Smart Kids. But Dave learned early on that when you give kids allowance, it creates the sense of entitlement, of because I exist, money shows up. Ah, uh, so it's you know? allowance is like every week you get a hundred exactly. bucks or something. But commission is when I do X, Y, Z, I will get paid this much. And this isn't like you're a member of the house, you help mom with the dishes. Sure. But if there's something extra you do, hey, clean out the attic and I'll give you 20 bucks. 
And so there's easy things you can do that are age appropriate. I'm not sure. talking about child labor here, yeah. you know, but as your kid gets older, they can understand this. And there's what I love to teach kids is there's only three things you can do with money. Hmm. Give, save and spend. A five year old can understand that concept. And it's a beautiful thing. We have our, our savers bank that you can get for kids. And it's a great way to just teach them when you get money. We're going to put a, if you get 10 bucks, we're going to put a dollar into the give side. Mm -hmm. We're going to put five dollars into the save side for the future. And then you get to spend the other four dollars and we're mm -hmm. going to go get a toy. So these are concepts you can teach kids early on to where you're kind of teaching the kid to fish. But do you think that's teaching kids then to just just be an employee? So I don't remember where I've heard this, but I've heard people talk about online where I don't want to give my kids, say, a salary or payment for doing X, Y, and Z, because then they get this mindset of, if I do I this, work for I get paid. Else. I work for somebody else. Mm. As opposed to me creating an income and building wealth, how can somebody potentially teach their kids that and yeah. break out of that kind of, that climbing the corporate ladder mindset? Well, I think a lot of uh, teens these days, they have that entrepreneurship mindset because they saw their parents work jobs they hated mm. to barely retire. Yeah. And so kids are going, wait, I can own this I can own my life and have a little more agency. And mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing. And some kids are cut out for it. And some kids are better off working a nine to five for someone else. And that's okay. You can be a W-2 employee and still oh, yeah. build great wealth. So it's not like it's one thing for everyone. But those that have that wiring to go the entrepreneurship route, I love it. You know, having the lemonade stand is such a great little P&L opportunity to go, yeah. all right, son, the lemonade costs you $5. You got to make at least that to break even. And if you make $10, here's how much profit you can make after all of your expenses. Mm. These are fun little things you can do with your kid. And as they get older, you'll find out what their passions are and you can help them understand that and make that profit and loss sheet with them Yeah. to show them, hey, buddy, the lemonade business, it cost you 20. You only made 10. Yeah. This is not, we got to change some things. We got to change our business model here. Right. Get, get better at marketing. And so those are some great ways to train your kid early on. And my guess is they end up going that entrepreneurship route when they understand how that works. So you, like you grew up in an immigrant house. Your parents are immigrants. We're from Syria and Yeah, Egypt. my mom was born in Syria. My dad was born in Egypt. Okay. How do you think that affected your upbringing with your parents not being born and raised in the United States? Mm. Well, I think um, with the immigrant mindset, there is a – you kind of have to work harder than everybody else. And you have this understanding that nothing is handed to you. And you also have an understanding of what was. Like when you didn't come from much, when you start to have something, it means more. Yeah. You know, there's not a sense of entitlement. You're grateful for that income. You're grateful for clean water in some instances. <laughs> you know, you're grateful for having a dishwasher. Yeah. And so I think it's a beautiful thing to, you know, and you get this perspective when you travel to like a third world country as an American, you're like, oh my gosh. And you come back for, and for a week, yeah. you're like, oh, I'm so grateful for all of this. <laughs> a warm bed and the heat and the yeah, AC, yeah, yeah. you know? So I think that's a, there's a beauty there. And there is a natural frugality, at least in Middle Eastern culture. I remember cutting up coupons with my dad every Sunday. Wow. And that's how we grocery shopped. It was like, what do we have coupons for? We're going to meal shop. We're going to shop based on that and meal prep based on that. Yeah. What's on sale at the grocery store? All right. Hey, chicken's down to one ninety nine a pound. We're doing chicken this week. Yeah. That's how we shopped. And then my, I also got to see my dad negotiate. And so anything that he could negotiate for, yeah. it became a game. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's I now am that guy in my family. My wife is like cringing every time I'm negotiating. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to go sit in the car. You have fun. But, you know, if you do it, if you're kind and you're being reasonable and of you're course. not trying to negotiate over the price of banana at the grocery store, yeah. you know, there's certain things you do that for. Um, I think that's a beautiful thing that we've we've lost the art of negotiation and being a kind person um, when it comes to those things. And I think most of Americans have a lot of shame when it comes to that. They'd rather pay full price and just swipe it on the credit card than be like, hey, do you have a, have a discount if I pay in cash? And hey, this one's damaged. Would you be willing to cut that down by 10 percent? Yeah. It's amazing what happens when you just ask. Yeah, I would I would 100 percent agree with that, because one thing my wife likes to do is anytime we go to the mall or go somewhere, we might be in line and she'll go to Google and she'll just search coupons for wherever you yes. are. And it'll take like 30 seconds. And more often than not, she'll find a 5 to 15% coupon off and we'll go up there and say, oh, I have this coupon. And right there, you just save 10 And they'll bucks. honor it. They'll honor it. Yeah, most people aren't willing to do that level of research where they say, that takes too much time. It's just more convenient. I don't, it's, it's not worth it. But I'm like, it adds up over time. It does. You know, four bucks here, 10 bucks here. 
and online purchases are the same way. I'm always the guy. People will text me now and be like, hey, I'm about to buy this. Do you have a promo code? And I'll be like, let me Google that for you. <laughs> yes, here's the promo code. And it doesn't take that much work to find it either. No, not in today's world. I mean, I have an extension called Honey on my browser. Oh, I love Honey. It yeah. searches the promo codes for you. And uh, you know, that's been a great tool where I'm like, you're at checkout. And they're like, hey, did you know you can get 20% off with this promo code? Or you can buy a gift card at 10% off and yeah. apply that. So that's a fun game to me on stuff I already plan to purchase. Yeah. So I never go, never spend to save. That's a big rule of mine. Spend to save. Don't spend Never spend save. money to save money. Yeah. You know, don't just buy it at J. Crew because it's a 40% off sale. Yeah. When you didn't really need it, but it was a good deal. Mm. You know, everything's a good deal when you don't buy it. That, it's 100% off. 100% off when you don't buy it. That's the immigrant mentality right there. But you said that growing up in an immigrant household, things were harder to come by. Is that a good thing? Or would you say that was a bad thing for you? Because in today's culture, I think there's a lot of uh, victimization of doing this harder for me. You don't get how hard it is. Mm. Is that a good thing or bad thing and why? I think we need we need that friction. When things are just easy, we start to live comfortable lives. We start to get a little fat, a little lazy, yeah. a little complacent, less driven. And I think you know, as human beings, we are created to have that drive and mm. to contribute to society and too many of us are just floating around like we're in Wally, -E, just kind of like, all right, where, where's my next meal coming from? And we're gla eyes glazed over at the TV screen all day. Yeah, I don't think that's what we were made for. Mm. And so I do believe with you know my my parents, they did such a great job raising us and instilling this in us that if we didn't have the money, it was just we don't have the money. Yeah, most parents can't stomach just saying that to their kid. Right. Two two letters. No. N O. No. Like you know, if we it was like, hey, can we stop? We have food at home. Right, that's the every immigrant mom. That's yeah, that was her uh, go-to line. We got food at home. I can make it better at home. It, and she always could. Yeah. My mom is mm, chef's kiss on <laughs> on that Middle Eastern cooking. Yeah. And so that's that's one thing. Learn how to cook, and you'll stop eating out. <laughs> yeah, 100 true, man. The last question I have for you is: Now you've been working with Dave Ramsey for a long time. How has that been? Like, how was it working with the man Dave, who has impacted so many people? Mm, man, the, it's a pinch myself moment every day. I've been on the team now for. Coming up on 11 years at Ramsey, I started as an intern. I had about six jobs until I landed in this Ramsey personality spot in the spotlight. Um, but I I tell people this, I would scrub the toilets around here. I believe in this place that much. I love that. The team is amazing. They truly have become my closest friends, family. My wife literally works here, so literally family. And uh, Dave's mission is there, there's a ripple effect that we'll never know that will go generationally because we're meeting people who go, oh, my parents went through Financial Peace University. That's how I was able to go to college debt free. That's how I was able to get my first home at 22 and pay it off by 25. Wow. And that's how we're able to live XYZ life and Amazing. give the way. And I'm like, that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's about legacy and impact. And so getting to now host the show next to Dave, yeah. I'll forget I'm inside of the Ramsey show because I'll be listening to a Dave rant with, you know, with my ears on, I'm going, this is good stuff. And then Dave will be like, what do you think, George? I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm in the show. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. You know, so it's it really is such a blessing to, you know, stand on the shoulders of a giant like Dave Ramsey. You know, yeah. I just launched this book, and I, I say in the book I feel like a turtle on a fence post because it takes so many people to make this video shoot happen, to do yeah. what we do. It's hard to take credit for anything around here. And um, there, it's such a – there's a weight of responsibility, too, of you're a face for this place. You represent – Yeah this place and we have more eyes on us we're a target because oh, yeah. dave's a person of faith which adds a whole layer of, of, of microscopes on dave and what everything he says and of does course. and we have controversial uh, ideas like live on less than you make and don't controversial touch ideas you know what i mean like gods and grandma's ways of money are now very controversial and so we we have a lot of heat coming at us but we know that our mission is is too important to ever quit but i want to one thing that you said that was really powerful was you said you'd be willing to scrub the toilets at this place. And I, the reason why I want to talk about that for a second is because we live in, I think, in a day and age where a lot of people would not do that. They would say, I am too good for that. My company doesn't pay me enough to do that. But yet you started here as an intern. Now you moved your way up to being a personality as the guy sitting next to Dave. And the difference, and we'll talk about any company now, between somebody, maybe you tell me what you think, that goes up and grows in the company, gets the pay raises, gets the bonuses, gets the promotions, 
is the person that's willing to scrub the toilets when they're doing something else is because mm. they care about the company mission. And most people don't want to do that. That's so true. You know, when people complain about, well, like, they're not giving me the opportunity and I deserve to get paid more. All I want to do is hold up a mirror and go like, hey, hi, it's you. You're, you're the problem. It's you. Like, it's not always the toxic company and the toxic boss. And it's your own posture. It's your own work ethic. And mm. I'm not saying you should bend over backwards and do whatever, but you got to hustle. Like, you got to commit to something for more than six months. Yeah. And I think too many people are... They're job hopping and they think that every day at work should just be rainbows and sunshine and yeah. we should just get to hang out and everyone should just get a wonderfully big paycheck. Like, you got to bust something. You got to kill it and drag it home, as Dave would say. Yeah. And so my journey was that of seizing every single opportunity, uh, trying to be as excellent as possible, being yeah. faithful in whatever was in front of me, no matter how menial of a task I thought it was. And that over time, they gave me more rope and mm -hmm. people noticed. So if that's you out there and you're feeling frustrated with your career trajectory and like, yes, you might need a career change. Sure. It might be a toxic course, employer. Absolutely. But a lot of the times you need to change your attitude and yeah. your mindset and have an attitude of, of service and absolutely. that posture of humility. And I've seen that go a long way. And, uh, you know, I, I've been here 11 years. I'm looking forward to the next 11. And I think Dave's still going to be here at 85 years old on the wow. radio. And for, they, he said until he doesn't make sense anymore, he's going to be in front of that mic. And so it's an yeah. honor to help take that torch and carry this message to new generations. And that's what I try to do with my book, Breaking Free from Broke. People yeah. are saying, this is total money makeover for 2024 for millennials and Gen Z. And so it's been an honor to even attempt to step in the shoes of Dave and all of us personalities. Well, we couldn't fill Dave's shoes, uh, but we're doing our best to help people every day. Well, dude, that was a lot of powerful stuff, man. I appreciate your time. Where can people learn more about you? Where can they get Breaking Free from Broke? And how can they learn more about what you're doing? Absolutely. Well, you can follow me at George Camel with a K on YouTube. We've got three videos a week that are funny. The team does an amazing job with these the edits. communications degree made you funny, In the dude. studio, yes. <laughs> that's exactly right. And our writers are so great. So we have the YouTube channel, George Camel. We have Instagram and all the social media channels. Uh, love to connect with people on there. And then Breaking Free from Broke is available on RamseySolutions.com, on Amazon, on Audible. We did a, a crazy thing with the audiobook, making it a whole immersive experience. Wow. And not just me reading. We have sound design, there's effects, I'm playing music in, oh, in and out really? of the chapters, there's debt-free screams woven in, it's it's powerful. The team did a really cool thing with that. So that's everywhere, RamseySolutions.com, Audible, and then wherever books are sold, you can check it out. Well, thank you, man. I got my copy of Break Free From Broke. I haven't started reading it's it. Personal. I will read it. I'm going to be reading that very soon. I highly recommend anybody watching this, listening to this, get your copy from Break Free From Broke. I have been talking to George for a while. I know anything that he's talking about, you have to understand because it's that common sense, money management, which isn't very common sense. But if you want to understand how you can build your wealth, how you can get out of debt, how you can start using your money as a tool to make yourself wealthy, listen to what he has to say. I'm telling you this from my own experience because I've talked to him outside of the camera as well. Read his book, listen to what he's doing. George, dude, thank you so much, Dude, man. it's such an honor. You're doing such yeah. amazing work. Likewise, I've been a man. fan of yours for a long time. Thank you, man. It's fun to be inside of Minority Mindset. Hey, dude, you gotta come to Detroit next time, I man. can't wait, we're getting Let's pizza. But that's why there's no financial education in schools, because if you knew how to handle debt, you wouldn't save that crappy dollar you have in your hand. I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather borrow the money tax-free. And then do what with it? I have to invest it to make more money. You know, when I talk to most idiots out there, they go, oh, I have a 401k. I go, well, you've been sold a bill of goods, sweetheart. <gasps> Oh. <gasps>